Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us, whether virtually or here in the room, for today's interview. Um, we've had a little bit of technical difficulties, but that's how things work in disability world. So nothing <laughs> too out of the ordinary for us, but I know we're running a little behind. So I will go ahead and jump into the interview with our guest. So Xiaorang Zhou is a research scholar at St. Cloud State University. She holds a master's degree in rehabilitation and languages. Xiaorang specializes in collaborating, cultivating, and utilizing her broad global network for the purpose of research and development of deaf culture-based programs and sign languages for both Chinese and American deaf academic communities. She also provides multicultural guidance regarding accessibility laws, cultural sensitivity, empowerment of deaf identities, and facilitations and collaborations between American Sign Language, Chinese Sign Language, Korean Sign Language for international deaf communities. When she's not working, Xiaorang loves traveling the world, trying new cultural food, and learning new regional sign languages. So welcome, Xiaorang, to the Tom and Ruth Harkin Center for International Education Week. We're excited to have you here today. Yes, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this. Uh, this is an honor for me to be here for this interview. And this is my name sign like this with my index finger and my pinky finger going in the Z shape like this. Yep. I'm from China. And I don't know what else am I supposed to say? <laughs> Perfect. Well, it's my job to ask the questions. <laughs> So you're perfect. Um, so we just read off your biography. Um, obviously, you have accomplished a lot in your career. And we are going to get to your more recent accomplishments. But I think for the people who haven't met you before, it would be good to go all the way back to talk about how you first became an advocate. So you are deaf. Um, can I ask if you were born deaf or did you become deaf later in life? Uh, I as a baby, I don't know whether or not I was hearing or deaf. Uh, my mother said that I was sick as a baby and I had very high fever. I went to the hospital. They gave me some medication, which caused the deafness. It was pen penicillin. And that's what caused my deafness. And that happened when I was approximately 11 month old. And, oh, and so I've been deaf basically all my life. And so what was your first exposure to sign language? Did you have a home sign that your family used or did you get formal instruction in Chinese sign language? I have an older sister who's deaf. Uh, she's seven years older than I am. When I was born and found out that I was deaf, she was like, oh, this is great. And so she exposed me to sign language. And so we always signed together and communicated with one another. She would guide me around at parks, when we would travel, when we'd go to museums and introduced me to many of the people in the deaf community. So I was exposed and learned sign. The rest of my family is all hearing and they would write back and forth with me to communicate. So, I mean, it must've been a huge help to have an older sister who was able to mentor you and, and teach you and show you the ropes, which is great. Not something that all deaf people have. Um, how else did being deaf affect your ability to be part of your community? Hmm. So hearing people tend to look at me as because I was deaf as being stupid, uh, needing to dumb things down. 
uh, that I was an evil person or something like that and insulted me quite a bit because of their perception of me being deaf. Uh, my family and my other family members uh, who were hearing were all educated, uh, but my education was different at the School for the Deaf than that of my hearing family. So, so it was definitely a challenge. And so right now, a lot of your work is in the field of inclusive education. And I know tomorrow we're going to have a whole panel about that. Um, but let's give today's audience a little bit of a <laughs> sneak peek. Um, so how do you or how did being deaf affect your access to education growing up in China? Hmm. So when I was at school, all of my teachers uh, could sign and I could uh, and I could communicate with my teachers and my peers, but the academics were definitely less than that of my hearing sisters and brothers. Uh, so if, you know, at, at, at what when I was in the th when I was potentially in the third grade and they were in the first grade, the difference of the academics that we were having, what well, I noticed that being different, the academics being different, not on the same grade level as my hearing siblings. And it was kind of disturbing. And so were you educated in a mainstream school or or was there separate deaf education? I went to the deaf. I went to the school for the deaf. Uh, back, it, there was a time when uh, there were about four hundred deaf students at the school for the deaf when I was there. Uh, there were many families that were genetically deaf who had multiple siblings, parents, and everyone that was deaf, and everybody was there together. Now, unfortunately, the schools for the deaf have changed and they just have a special education school for people with disabilities, blind, wheelchair, deafness, all together in a uh, school for disabilities. So it sounds like deaf education or inclusive education has changed from when you were growing up in China till today. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Or do you think these are Positive changes, negative, neutral. So there were schools for the deaf, there are special education schools, and then there are mainstream schools. The schools for the deaf are great for being able to have social cultural uh, signing with one another understanding and very positive and everybody was happy, but the education and the curriculum was definitely watered down. The special education programs for blind, uh, cognitive uh, disabilities, wheelchairs, those were all mixed and it was really hard to figure out where your identity was. You lost your identity being mixed amongst all of that population. Mainstream schools are good. The education is great, but the social but the social part is difficult. It's a lot of lip reading, and you don't really get to interact with other people. But the but the academics is more on par. So, how do you think your educational experience uh, affected you and and made you the advocate that you are today? We like to change interpreters. Oh. Well, you know, my brothers and sisters, I saw what they were getting in school and I looked, you know, I could see that uh, it was better than mine and I wasn't happy with that. Uh, I'm sorry, I've, I've lost uh, the track there, hold on. Yep. Uh, 
my brothers and sisters, you know, had a better education. I could see that. And, uh, you know, while I was studying, I was seeing, you know, deaf people within the community oppressed. And I didn't see very many opportunities for people who were deaf to, you know, get a job that upset me. I'm sorry. This is another interpreter in the room. She's talking about herself. She had no opportunity for employment. Um, she didn't have opportunity for education. Do you want me to take over voicing? Sure, yeah. go ahead. If you want to sign, I'll voice. That'll be fine. Good teamwork. Should I ask my question again? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Ask the question again. <laughs> perfect. Thank you. Um, so uh, my question was, how do you think that your experience growing up in that education system or with that style of education shaped you into the, the advocate that you are today? So again, uh, my hearing siblings had different opportunities. I was diff it was difficult for me to find jobs. I wasn't able to find employment. So once I got finished with school, I went to my graduate school and I got exposed to so many different identities and deaf leaders and deaf opportunities. And I finally got my foot in the door. And when I graduated, I was able to come to America. And that is what truly impacted me when I came here, uh, coming and meeting Dr. Kubi. Kufi. Gooby. Koopy with a K. Kubi. Nah. John Johnson and John Johnson. Uh, that really had a huge impact on me. She's freezing. So the, the names of the people are Amy Knopf mm -hmm. and Katherine Johnson. She is, just so you know, on the interpreter side, she's for her video just froze during that. And that was part of our problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that everybody. No, I appreciate, I appreciate the right names. Feet. No, I appreciate the names, but she froze completely like this, but froze beautiful. You, you look pretty when you're frozen. <laughs> So having experience of meeting Amy Knopf, Amy Knopf and Kathy Johnson uh, allowed me to become a self-advocate and to raise my own self-esteem. Uh, there were things that I didn't know and they were mentoring me, me and I was learning from them. And Amy was in a graduate program and I joined that class of her graduate program. And then I learned more about that, uh, those opportunities for rehab. And I saw, okay, I can change what was happening in China. I wanted to see more expansion, more growth, more support. Uh, instead of just having one type of education, instead supporting themselves, instead of everyone having the opportunity to support themselves and increase their self-esteem of what it is that they're learning and what they're wanting to be a part of. So that kind of leads me to my next question then, that you mentioned some of these differences between maybe what is inclusive education in China and now what you've learned in this field in the United States. And of course, even between advocates, we can all define inclusive education a little differently. So I'm wondering if you would share your own philosophy or idea on how do you define inclusive education? So for inclusive education, it's important for deaf people to have access to communication. Uh, whether that is through sign, through visual opportunities, but not dependent on audio and just listening or lip reading. Having that visual language, having interpreters, having closed captioning, 
and uh, messaging and just getting the right messaging for communication. Hearing education and deaf education needs to be at the same caliber of curriculum. There shouldn't be a different curriculum depending on your hearing status. A lot of information is being lost and people are and people in deaf education are not being taught the same information as hearing people. That should not matter what their hearing status is as to what they learn. They shouldn't be isolated. They should have the opportunity to learn all of the same types of information and have the same opportunity at information regardless of their modality of accessing that information and being integrated in the community with communication. So in your mind, is there a difference between deaf education and inclusive education? Are they one and the same? Are there slight differences between, between those two fields? I'm sorry, if the interpreter could sign again, please. I didn't understand what the interpreter was saying. Could you repeat the question, please? I think the situation depends on the, you know, there's no reason education needs to be lowered and the curriculum needs to be lowered for someone who uses sign language. Having the same curriculum accessible, having communication that's accessible, that to the same as their hearing counterparts is what's most important. Uh, so what's happening is the deaf schools are great because they're signing and visual, but the hearing schools have the better curriculum. And so how to integrate the two of them. If, if a deaf person is uh, isolated in, in a silo and they don't have that opportunity to interact with one another and to learn from each other, the skills are lowered. And so this is the way to keep things up. So like for me growing up, deaf education, I got information, but my information was limited. When I finally came to the United States, and was with my hearing colleagues, I learned so much more. I felt much more confident about what I knew and what I was learning. So I know this is your first time here at the Harkin Institute, and we're really happy to have you. Um, you might know that the primary focus of our work at the Institute is on employment of people with disabilities. Yes. And so I'm wondering how you think that this access to education affects deaf Chinese people's ability to find jobs, support themselves and their families, be integrated in the community and the workforce. Oh, yes, it is very important. Every day, you know, looking at the ADA law and all of the advocacies that were provided by that for deaf education that has improved education and the ability for deaf people to thrive. I think in general, deaf people didn't know. They didn't know how to, uh, you know, approach a boss, get a job, do things. Literacy was an issue. So I think education is what's most important for exposing people to those skills and being more literate. Again, uh, finding your own job and finding the ability to have a job. I know a long time ago, deaf education, you know, there wasn't a lot, there wasn't a lot of opportunities. Are we saying steal? Yes. Okay. Okay. So there wasn't a lot of opportunities. Uh, things, you know, they were thinking uh, deaf people were only considered to be thieves. They were, they were looked at them as, oh, they're thieves. They steal things. They're bad people. They're evil people. But it was not because of who they were. It was because they didn't have the opportunity for the education that everybody else was afforded. And so now uh, people are understanding more about the deaf community and we are understanding more about ourselves and being able to find jobs, find employment, having a good quality of life, which is something that education affords you. And if you don't have the education, then you don't know and you don't have those opportunities. 
So let's, speaking of work, let's transfer now to talking about your work. Um, you are at St. Cloud State University um, as a researcher, as I mentioned earlier. Could you tell us a little bit about what your research is about? What type of projects and work are you doing now? So I'm working on a curriculum development in Chinese sign language and teaching methods, pedagogy. In China, there isn't really a teaching method for the teachers to use at the schools for the deaf because they don't really have an experience of it. You know, they just teach at a word level instead of, they're like, here's the sign for this, let's sign that. But instead of actually taking the curriculum of ASL that you have and the resources and the materials and the educational opportunities here in the United States and bringing that over to China. The, so as, um, ASL, master ASL, signing naturally, all of those types of curriculums for learning ASL are being, uh, where I've been researching those to, to borrow those curriculums and apply them to Chinese sign language for how to teach. Uh, working as a consultant in that framework, going from ASL to CSL. The Center for CIDIA, Center, Center for International Disability Advocacy. Uh, and diplomacy. And diplomacy. And diplomacy, yeah. <laughs> And working with Dr. Uh, Kath Kathy Johnson and Dr. Amy uh, Kampf, as well as Sh Sherry for encouraging deaf people to come and work on this study from, so you've got American students as well as Chinese students working together and sharing with one another through the language. And then there's a company that we're working with that is uh, supporting a deaf camp, uh, teacher training opportunities. So lots of different things that we're getting involved with. Uh, many different uh, things happening at St. Cloud University. No, it sounds like it. It sounds like you have a lot of projects going on in this research and knowing Dr. Johnson and Dr. Knopf, that's not surprising to me either. Um, so could you tell me a little bit more about how you are developing this curriculum? You mentioned collaborating with deaf American students and deaf Chinese students. Are there many other deaf Chinese people at St. Cloud State you're working with, or are you working long distance or virtually with them in China? It's mostly virtual, virtual, excuse me. And so we interact from here in the US back to China. Uh, and what, when the students need certain things, I'm able to assist and facilitate that. So what is the, oh, sorry. And you wanted to know about the curriculum development also? Yes, so I, I was going to ask, um, are you making a Chinese sign language textbook or is it video modules or what is the structure of the curriculum and then how are you sharing that with Chinese institutions how will it be used it's a pro it's a pro it's in process it's a work in process and I'm not the only one working on it there are Chinese students that are creating videos. If it was just me all day long doing it, it would be very difficult, I'd go crazy. But it's a work in progress and we're all kind of doing it together and it's not something I'm giving up on, but continuing to work on that curriculum. Tell me a little bit more about 
the camp that you mentioned, what is, what's the audience for that camp? Any, any details you could share with, with everybody? Sure. So deaf Chinese high school students don't really know their deaf identity, don't know their deaf culture. Some of them don't even sign. And the camp is an opportunity for them to meet other people, understand their identity, understand what it means to be deaf and actually be able to thrive and succeed and go to university so that they can discover themselves. Many deaf uh, high school Chinese students are like, oh, I can't do that. I don't have those abilities. I don't know what to do. And coming to the camp, they have that opportunity and that exposure to leadership and learning and language and identity. Identity. So we're facilitating that through the camp. So do the these... If I could add one more thing. The, uh, you know, many of their teachers don't expose them to sign language, they just read, uh, you know, and they read aloud and they have to try and get the information that way and there isn't any social opportunities for them with other students like them. So will this camp take place in China or in the United States? Where will, where will it be? It's in China. It's in China. Uh, in China, we'll have that camp. And then in the United States uh, next year, we will be expanding the camp, right? 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 <laughs> if you're interested, come, come to camp, come to camp, come learn more. <laughs> right. That, that's, that's what I was going to ask is how, how could anyone watching this video get involved with the camp? Maybe they know a young deaf person either Chinese or American who may want to get involved. Um, so where where could they find more information about about the camp as it develops? That's a good question. Uh, the Chinese high school students, because of course there's many different uh, schools and programs throughout China. They do have different uh, flyers and brochures that are being sent out amongst in the country. However, in America, uh, if you're wanting access to those brochures and networking, we can get that to you as well. Uh, via the website and you can find that information online at the website email, we have different collaborators that are helping with that. A-L-N-A-L. Oh, the Anik. Uh, it's near, it's on the mountainside. It's uh, very beautiful. That's where the camp is. Uh, and it will be next summer, June. Uh, it's in the Annick Castle in England is where the camp will be. And they'll be and they'll be um, offering ASL classes as well. Uh, well, there'll be an international opportunity for international students to uh, intermix with one another. Uh, information will be on the website shortly. You know the Harry Potter. You know, you know the Harry Potter ca castle. <laughs> the, the video of Harry Potter. It'll be just like that. It'll be a Harry Potter type video. <laughs> but it, it will be like a deaf, deaf Harry Potter. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Like that kind of a castle. It is the castle where Harry Potter was filmed. Oh, it was. It, oh, it, okay. So Annick Castle is the castle where Harry Potter, where Harry Potter was filmed. That's the, where the camp was going to be. Thank you for the clarification. Right. I I want to go to that camp. I don't know if I'm able to get an invitation, but <laughs> um, come on, you can come. Sure. 
<laughs> ask them. They'll give you permission to come. You have to ask them. If they give you permission, then you can come to camp. Perfect. Um, so. You know, take ASL classes, learn all about it, and then you can come to camp. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I'll, I'll hold everyone to that invitation um, and looking forward to it. So let, let's go back a little bit to the broader body of work that you do. How do you view um, or how do you see this work advancing the rights of deaf people in China? Oh, absolutely it will. Obviously, I, I, I'm a team of one. I, I can't do it alone. So <laughs> by ha having more advocacy and growing our pool of people, we will have strength in numbers and people will be more willing to adopt this program. You know, I can't fight it all by myself, but by uh, encouraging more people worldwide to partner with me to make this a stronger opportunity and a stronger program. So what is the ultimate goal of the, the deaf Chinese people that join the camp, they engage in this curriculum? How do you see that leading to their growth or or leading to their development? Are they going to join your cause? Is the goal to have them be strong self-advocates? Is it to promote literacy, education, employment? Maybe all of the above, <laughs> but talk a little bit more about maybe that self-advocacy movement among deaf Chinese people in China. Um, I think often many people want to be able to have the opportunity to come to the United States because the exposure, the interaction, the rights, the cultural identity is much easier in the United States. In China, it is difficult. It's, it's still struggling uh, being able to video with them and just having some of the technology and opportunities here. And so looking at the ability to come to the United States, interact and socialize with people to help them find themselves, finding a job and doing things. So I think people are willing to be a part of our program just to make sure that everybody has equal opportunities at, at what is available to them. So you mentioned that one of the main aspects of your work is developing this Chinese sign language curriculum to maybe standardize the education practices there. So what do you think is the future of deaf and or inclusive education in China? I don't know how to answer that. That's a really loaded question. I can't predict, I can't control things. Uh, you know, other people are having to make that decision, but ultimately it will help. It will take time. We're working on strategies to make it available. So let, let me change my question then. <laughs> if I made Zhou Xiaorang the ministry, the minister of education for China, and you had that control, how would you create deaf education and inclusive education if, if you could snap your finger and, and make that change? <laughs> Ooh, good question, that's hard. <laughs> Uh, yeah, mm, I would have more programs that are deaf led programs. I would have people come and teach our teachers and train them so that they have mentors and they're ready to pass along that information to the next generation. I want the community in China to have a higher education academic goals for their deaf students. 
and then of course I want to help Dr. Uh, Johnson and Dr. Knopf with expanding their research and their program. So for anyone who is joining us virtually, or I guess those of us in the room as well, uh, how can we get involved to support the work that's going on with your research, but at the Center for International Disability Advocacy and Diplomacy? How they can support? the Center of Advocacy and Diplomacy? Right, how, how can we get involved? It, is there a way for people outside of St. Cloud State to get involved, to provide assistance, or, or even just to learn more? There's research, there's academics, there's disability access, there's colla online collaborative, there's education policy, different strategies. Uh, funding, of course, would be nice. There's finance and funding issues. Uh, policy, uh, we have all of those things involved in the program. If you look at CIDA online on the website, you'll be able to, uh, well, actually the website will be updated soon for CIAD. And so you can look there to find out more information. And I, I think the website or the organization is CIDAD. Thank you. CIDAD. Right. Just to make sure that everyone who's going to rush to the website knows exactly where to go. I don't want you going to the wrong place. <laughs> Appreciate it. And this is not a US only uh, opportunity. It's for anyone internationally. Anybody can come and join the CIDAD. We welcome everyone. So that, that kind of makes me think of what other support might be needed from the international community, either in your work at CIDAD, or what assistance can the international community provide to deaf people in China? Hmm. Having more students coming to study would be wonderful. Uh, but in order for that to happen, there needs to be funding. We have 10 students that have been approved for next year to start and to come study here. So that's a wonderful start. The students from China? From China? Yeah. Yeah, but you know, the, the more financial support we could get, the more students we can bring. So we're seeking financial support. No, that's great to hear. It sounds like the program is really growing quickly. Uh, anybody wanna give us some money and support us? We would be happy to accept that money to support the organization and to support this uh, efforts that we're working on. We're open to your uh, receiving your donations. Oh, funding opportunities for the 10 students to come. Yes, yes, yes. Any... Yeah, the 10 students really want to be here. They've been accepted. And so we're just needing to find the funding. And so we're continuously looking for those funding opportunities. For them. So the largest amount of support that you would need right now, it sounds like would be to in a scholarship fund or otherwise cover some expenses for those students to come. Correct. Okay. Correct. Great. It, it's always important to make sure that when we, we make our asks that we know exactly what the right type of help is going to be. So I want to make sure that everybody watching us was, was getting that. So if you know, I'll, I'll look into the camera, if you know any opportunities to support these students, feel free to get in touch with Xiaorang or the, the staff at St. Cloud State and the Center for International Disability Advocacy and Diplomacy. Yes, the C-I-D-A-D. -D. Please, please, please. 
Um, so I know we are winding down on time a little bit, but I just have a couple last questions. Um, so this is a, a similar question, but I'm wondering for those of us watching who are hearing, how can hearing people best be allies to deaf people? And maybe we can talk about that in the United States. I don't know if it, your answer would be different in China, but how can we as hearing allies best support you and other deaf advocates so that you are leading this work effectively? Hearing people who understand deaf culture uh, and are willing to be involved and deaf people that are open to having a connection and a relationship to supporting and mentoring these people. Uh, you know, Amy and Kathy are both hearing, but they support me. They mentor me to ensure my success. So other people similar to them can definitely be an asset to the program. You know, a hearing person empowering a deaf person is a gain for everyone because you can see, you know, they're learning opportunities about the culture. We're learning opportunities so that we both can succeed and benefit from this mutual relationship. For example, on an iPhone, you know, everybody can you took on an iPhone and talk, but then deaf people realized, hey, we need something more than just talking on a phone. And so technology changed and made it better and made FaceTime. So now deaf people can, you know, see each other to communicate, but hearing people are using that benefit as well. So looking at things through a deaf lens actually benefits everyone. So working in collaboration and not just saying, well, this is only for you or this is only for us, but actually collaborating and seeing one another as the foundation of making a bridge between the communities benefits everyone. So a follow-up to that question then is something that I see a lot in the general disability rights movement that I would assume is also present in the deaf movement is that a lot of times allies have good intentions and want to be supportive, but end up centering the discussion or pulling the focus away from the people with lived experience. And so that's maybe what I'm asking as you know, myself as a hearing person who wants to be an ally, but for other hearing allies too, what is the best way that we could provide support without making it about us or pulling that focus or opportunity away from people who are deaf themselves? I think we need to give more presentations about deaf culture, deaf identity, allowing deaf people to expose the community about things uh, and allowing other people to be involved in learning. Uh, it's not about the helping model. We don't like that concept of help. Instead, it's advocacy. You advocate for me, you support me, and we develop a relationship about it. Uh, exposure to for deaf people to work with one another and figure out what they need. Don't blame someone for not knowing or for not asking. Instead, support someone and giving them the advice that they need to make things accessible. It's a two-way street. It works both ways. We collaborate with one another. There's no wrong there's no wrong person in this relationship. It's important to give all the workshops to expose people about and educate people about the community. My example, if you go to the food store, if you're, if I'm trying to find something and I can't find it and somebody comes up to me and they're talking to me and they're coming, you know, right up in my face, trying to talk to me and 
I don't understand. Instead, if they were to take a step back, gesture with me, work with me to try to find what I need to. Same thing with families. What they do is they come, they are gestural, they make big motions in order to show that they are engaged and working with someone. It helps someone's self-esteem and confidence to show that you're willing to go out of your comfort zone to do something to meet someone where they're at. Hearing people are like, oh, a deaf person. I don't know what to do with that. What do I do? But instead, you know, making an effort, make, trying, trying to figure out another way. You can always get a piece of paper and pencil and write. There are many different ways, many different creative ideas that communication and connection can happen. Think outside of the box. Think about other ideas. Great. So you mentioned one opportunity that is empowering is giving presentations. So I want to use that to, of course, plug that tomorrow you are giving a presentation. You'll be speaking at Drake University here um, for International Education Week about inclusive education in China. So hopefully everybody joins us again tomorrow for that conversation. Of course, we have to plug our programming, right? <laughs> um, aside from what is going to be an amazing panel tomorrow, What's next for Xiaorong? What is something in your work that you're really excited about? What are some opportunities you have in this year that that's energizing to you? What's what's next? I laugh because the interpreter froze halfway through your question. <laughs> you want me to ask the question again? Sorry. Yes, please. If okay. you could. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. Right. It would be hypocritical not to <laughs> repeat and provide communication access in this discussion. So let's let's always model that appropriately. I will repeat my question. So I won't repeat maybe the plug for tomorrow's presentation, but of course, that's something we're all excited to see and, and hear more about your research specifics tomorrow morning. Uh, but outside of, of your presentation tomorrow and, and your other work here at Drake University this week, what's next for Xiaorong? What is an opportunity you have coming up that you're excited about? What's something that people could engage in? What's something in your research you're really excited about uh, in the next year? Yeah, I'm excited uh, to hopefully get the funding for those 10 students to come from China to Amer America, to be able to mentor them, to expose them, to continue working on and to continue working on and developing with the CIDAD uh, and to expand all of the work that we've been doing. Okay, great. Well, that does take us to the top of the hour here. So I want to thank you, Xiaorong, so much for taking the time to talk with me and, and everybody this, this morning um, on, this, on this exciting International Education Week. Thank you for sharing all of your experiences and things going on at the Center for International Disability Advocacy and Diplomacy. And thank all of you for joining us today, either virtually or here in person at the Tom and Ruth Harkin Center at Drake University, home of the Harkin Institute. My name is Daniel Van Sant, and it's been great talking with you, Xiaorong, and, and talking with all of you today. Thank you to our interpreters, and everyone else have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. I'll stop the recording.